right, you should all be familiar with uh, inverse functions, at least the basics of inverse functions. Is that true? At least like what they mean and all that stuff. What does it mean yes. for a function to be the inverse of another? Or how do we find the inverse of a function? How do we find the inverse of a function? If we're given, a, given an equation, how do we find its inverse? Switch the x and then solve for it. Right, switch the x and the uh, and the y values, right, and then resolve for y, right. So we're just taking the y's and replacing them with x's, and vice versa, taking the x's and replacing them for y's, right. You all remember that. And graphically, how are the um, how are inverse functions related? They're reflections across the line y equals x. Right, exactly. They're a reflection across the line y equals x. Um, and even more fun and interesting than this. What happens if you take the take f of the inverse of f on x? What do you end up with? Yes. You just end up with x, right? And the same if you do f inverse of f of x, you should still end up with x. Either way you do it. Okay. Um, and that's because they're reflections of each other over the line y equals x. Um, everybody good with that? And we know about points. So like suppose f and g are inverses, or we'll just say f. Suppose f has the point a comma b, what point do you know that f inverse must have on it? b comma a. b comma a. All right, these are all things you should all just sort of know from previous years, yeah? I hope. Okay. So there's one more thing that we're going to now know about inverse functions, and that is that there's a relationship between the derivatives of inverse functions. So the relationship is as follows. If we have f inverse, so here's f inverse, right, this blue little function here, and we know that it contains the point a comma b, um, we can relate that derivative, so the slope of the tangent line at a, with the slope of the inverse function, so our f function at b. And those slopes should be reciprocals of each other. So if you have a function, um, we'll say f, that has a point a, b, and the inverse of that function f that has the point b, a, the slopes of f at a and f inverse at b should be reciprocals of each other. Does that sort of make sense? Or no? I'll take that as a no since nobody's responding. So I'm going to say this in a slightly different way. Um, if F, and I'm just saying F and G are inverses and f contains the point a, b, and g contains the point b, a, then f prime of a is equal to 1 over g prime of b. That is, in the most basic terms I can write it, that's the inverse rule. That if the two functions are inverses, then the derivative at one of their x values is equal to the reciprocal of the derivative of the other one at the corresponding x value. That makes sense or no? Makes sense. Okay. So let's take a look. We're just going to do two quick and easy problems with this. So let's do this nice easy one first. We've got f of x is equal to x cubed. And we know that g is the inverse of f. We want to find g prime of 8. So there's two ways we could go about this. And we're actually going to do both ways. First way is using the inverse rule um, that I just stated to you guys. And the second way is we could actually find the inverse of f of x and then take its derivative. Um, both ways should be pretty easy. Um, but it's important to know the rule, because for some functions, you won't be able to find the inverse real easily. Like this one, you can, but some other ones you won't. So first off, what do we know? We know that f and g are inverses, and we know that g 
contains a point that has an x value of 8. And that's where we're looking for the derivative of g. Everybody agree that g must have some point where the x value is 8? Yes. Okay. So if g has some point where the x value is 8, then f of x must have a related point in which the y value is also 8. Right? That's, that's how inverse functions work. True? Yeah. Okay, so could we find what these other values are? They should be the same number. How can we figure out what this x value on f of x is? Plug it in. Like you could plug in the one yeah, as y. Say that again? You could plug in the eight for the y value. Sorry, right. that's how. Yeah, first thing you said didn't make a lot of sense, but, but the second thing you did did. So if we set that x cubed equal to 8, then we should know that that gives us x equals 2, right? And so that tells us that the derivative of g at 8 should be 1 over the derivative of f at 2. So this part right here, this is the inverse rule part of it. And so without figuring out an actual explicit equation for g, we should still be able to figure out its derivative at this value we're interested in. Because we can find the derivative of f really easily, right? What's f prime? f prime of x is 3x squared. And if we evaluate that at 2, what do we get? 12. So we end up with 1 over 12. Good or no? Okay. Okay. So let's make sure that we are right by actually finding the inverse. So our original function was f of x equals x cubed, right, or y equals x cubed. So to find the inverse of that, what would we do? We'd write x equals y cubed and get y, which is equal to g of x, should be what? x to the Okay. So the one -third. To the one-third power, exactly. And so now, if we wanted to find g prime of 8, well, we'd take the derivative of x to the one-third, one-third x to the negative two-thirds, and evaluate it at 8, which would be 1 over 3, and 8 to the two-thirds, and 8 to the two-thirds, cube root the 8 first to give you 2, square it to give you 4 times the 3 is 12. Good or no? See that it works both ways? Yes, no, maybe. Yep. All right. So, what's the point? What's the point of this rule if I could just find the inverse? Well, there are many functions where it's not so easy to find the inverse. Like, suppose I gave you this y equals the sine of x squared plus x minus y to the fifth power. I'm sorry, not minus y to the fifth power, minus x to the fifth power. Are you going to have an easy way to find the inverse of this function? Anybody think they could exchange the x and the y values here and explicitly solve for y so that all the other terms were x's? I don't think you could. So we want to be able to use this rule in cases like that where we can't take the inverse real easily. So here's another one. And in this one, we won't be able to take the derivative, I mean, not the derivative, but the inverse very easily. Right? If f of x equals e to the x plus x, that's going to be very difficult to find the inverse function of. So we're going to use the inverse rule here. And the inverse rule is telling us we want g to have an x value of 1, which means that f needs to have a, a what? 
Y value of one. A Y value of one, exactly. So we'll set E to the X plus X equal to one. And again, algebraically, that's not a super easy equation to solve. But if you just think about some fairly simple numbers, you should be able to figure out what the solution to that is. What is X need to equal for that to be true? Zero. Zero, right? E to the zero is one plus zero is still one. So X is zero. One, zero, zero, one. And so what should G prime of one be the same as? G prime of one should equal one over what? F prime of zero. F prime of zero. And all we need to do is find F prime of zero. F prime of zero, well, what's the derivative of F? Should be E to the X plus one. And we'll evaluate that at X equals zero to get what? Hopefully two. So G prime of one equals one over two. Good or no? Good. Any questions on that? That's the inverse rule. It always pops up at least once every year on the AP test. Except in years like last year where it was weird. But normally there's one problem that you gotta use the inverse rule for, or, or more, but at least one. 